a lot of ways to tie your shoes, and here's the way I do it. Let's see that more slowly. Start by crossing your shoelaces one over the other. Pull them firmly. Then make a nice loop with one lace and hold it. Wind the other one over it and then come underneath with a loop. Grab both loops and pull. Now let's take a look at it with the other hand. And again, we'll do it a little more slowly this time. And again, we'll do it a little more slowly this time. I don't think you guys need to see it slowly. <laughs> Well, would you guys agree that's a way to tie shoes? Everyone tie their shoes that way? Some people may do like the double ear, the, the, the double ears or something like that, but does everyone tie their shoes that way? Not me. No. No. I do. Uh, you don't? I just yeah. learned right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's kind of just, well, that's kind of like the standard way. A lot of times, that's the way people teach their kids, or they do it with the, you know, the mouse ears or rabbit ears or something like that. But my point is, that's pretty basic, and that's the way most of the world does stuff. Right? Wow. But you guys are a little different. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just show you. The reason why is because you're going to learn some things. You'll, my point is that there's some very basic things. You think about tying your shoes, right? And John Wooden, when he taught the, um, you know, when he would teach his basketball players, the very, very first thing that he would do when he brought his players in, right? And these were all championship players, eventually. He would take and sit them down, make them put their socks on, and, and tie their shoes. Put their shoes on, stuff like that. Because if you have a foundation, that's your most solid foundation for basketball, right? It's your so you have to be sure that what you're doing is, you know, a good foundation. So this is the way that you can do things, but I'll show you that there's an easier, or not an easier way, but there's a better way to do it that um, if you ever had it where you're, uh, you're, um, you're doing your shoes or you're in sports or something like that, and your shoe keeps on time, all right? All through the day, your shoe keeps on time, right? That's because people tie their shoes like this, right? I'll show you a way that your shoes won't untie anymore until you want to tie them. Tie them in the morning, and you untie them at night, and that's it. I'm going to show you how to tie your shoes with a knot that is guaranteed to never slip. Start as you normally would with an overhand knot. Then when you get to this point, instead of going around once, go around twice before pulling the second loop through. This one little extra step makes all the difference and I guarantee you the knot is not going to slip. Still, when you want to take off your shoes, this knot is as easy to untie as any other. Start as you normally would, with an overhand knot. Then, when you get to this point, instead of going around once, go around twice before pulling the second loop through. And it's all the difference in the world. This when you do that second step time, makes all the difference, and I guarantee it makes it a little harder to take slip. apart, but the difference Still, is when you, you do it, it'll only come apart when you want to tie as any other. That's something everybody does. I mean, how many times have you tied your shoes? So the whole thing is like with some of the stuff with visualization, it's something that you've kind of done, but it's more a matter of a better way to accomplish things. <coughs> okay, so what's created as visualization, right? It's not thinking positive. It's not like, um, oh, you know what? I'm the best master surgeon. 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 Oh, <coughs> right, yeah. Let's go to the oper operating room, right? Because it's not going to work. You know, you have to do some kind of preparation for that. So what, what's uh, the difference between imagination and visualization, right? So imagination, and we've all done that, where you just think of a mental image of something that is in your head, but it's not something you're actually sensing physically, right? I don't actually see it, you know, in front of me. I don't feel it. I don't touch it. Um, and yet it's, I'm still feeling it and touching it inside my head. That's imagination. Right? So how does that change from creative visualization? So when you're doing creative visualization, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, change your outer world 
based on your inner world, right? So what happens is you seek to affect the outer world in changing one's thoughts and using one's imagination to visualize specific behaviors or events occurring in one's life, right? That was like the girl with the sports, you know, the sports thing. Here she's failing, you know, what she's trying to do. So it's like, okay, let's take a step back. You know, like the thing, tying our shoes. Say, hey, you know what, there's a better way to tie your shoes. There's a better way to go ahead and try to create the things that you want to create. The good news is it's almost like magic because you really don't have to know what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. You just have to know what the picture is at the end and somehow your body is going to figure it out. And there's even more to that. I'll tell you some of, some of the things that might be a little bit surprising from my personal background. So one of the things that you try to do is you try to create one of the desires, right, and then do it over and over and over and over and over again until it actually happens, right? You know, if you think about it, it's like asking Santa Claus, hey, you know what, I want this great bike. You know, kind of thing, and keep asking and asking and asking and asking and asking, and eventually, like, oh my gosh, I can't take it anymore. Right? Here's a bike. You know, just like kids do with you when you're uh, a parent. Okay, so how does creative visualization work? Um, you have to recognize that the physical universe is energy, right? We're all atoms. That that's that's the whole thing. Is that um, you know Einstein said you know energy is neither created nor destroyed, right? Um, so the whole secret to all this stuff is that we're all energy. You know, we're like electrical fields. And energy is magnetic, right? So the reason why that's significant is because uh, magnetic stuff attracts each other, right? North Pole attracts a, a, the needle the, from, from the uh, magnet. And then the other thing is form follows thought. If you were to go, oh, you know what, I need to go out to my car, right? How does that start? You're first thinking, oh, I got to go out to my car, right? And then you actually do it. I think in the Bible, you know, they'll say um, first was the was the word, and then the word became flesh, right? It's the same kind of idea that you have a concept, and then the concept eventually hardens, and it follows the law of radiation and attraction, right? So, um, visualization, creative visualization, works two ways that we both transmit and we receive. You know, an example that I give is that um, how many people have been with a spouse? You know, it could be their wife, could be a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something like that. You're in the car and you're driving. And you're, you know, traveling for like an hour or something and nobody's saying anything. And then what happens is you're thinking of something, and it may not necessarily be the car, it could be just sitting in the room, but you're thinking of something and then out of nowhere, you know, you say, oh, you know what, I was just thinking, remember that one time we were at the gas station, you know, for this thing? And it was something that happened two years ago, five-minute event, and the other person says, oh, my gosh, I was thinking of that same thing. Has anyone had something like that happen? You know, it happens all the time, right? And so what happened was I started to think of what's the possibility, what's the likelihood of something like that happening, even though I know it happens all the time, right? Now, if it was a, a five-minute event, no, a one-hour event that happened two years ago, the chance of that happening is like 1 in 17,000. For just me, if it actually happens to me, for me just thinking that's 1 in 17,000, right? If it was a five minute event two years ago, and this is only going back two years, it's 1 in 225,000, okay? So that's just for me to think about it. So for me to think about it is 1 in 225,000. For the other person next to me to think about it, clearly they did, because we weren't talking, we didn't see anything in front of us, it's 1 in 225,000 for them. If you take and you multiply that out, it's like 1 in a trillion or something like that. So it's impossible. For you to think about it, and for them to think about it at the same time, the odds of that happening is like 1 in a trillion. And if it happened once in your lifetime, they'd be like, okay, that was my 1 in a trillion. But it doesn't, it happens all the time, right? So one of the things that that brings up is thoughts or things that you definitely transmit and people pick that stuff up. And it's like, um, there's an expired class that, that I know of, an expired teacher, and he said something that, you know, it's kind of common sense, but when you hear it, all of a sudden a light bulb goes on, it's like, oh, of course. Because there's three ways that we communicate, right? You know, you've heard, you've heard about the, the conscious mind, right? And we'll talk more perhaps on that. You have the conscious mind. You have the subconscious mind, right, which is below that level. And that's the one that really kind of drives stuff through our life, that we can, um, you know, we can kind of lie about something. We can say, oh, I'm doing this. But if your subconscious, all its experience has a different result, you're not going to be able to lie to it. Right? And that's like, you know, someone that's, that creates something bad and, and on a subconscious level they're creating a bad one. So, on the, those first two levels, you know, maybe you can fool someone. 
you know, on that, on the conscious level and subconscious level, like if I was talking to you and I was trying to sell you something, I could do it on the conscious level and subconscious level that I could convince you, right? But there's another level that we have, and it's like a core level. And this is the one that's really, you, you can't like lie. And it's one of the reasons, and women actually are better at it. The core level is, is an element that, no, no, not lying. I mean, I mean, I mean the fact that, that they're the ones that pick it up. And it's, an, and it's an intuitive level. So what happens is I can say, hey, you know what, I'm going to sell you this, and I, you know, this is great for you. And in my subconscious, I kind of convince it's great for you. But at my core level, I'm saying, this is a terrible idea. This is a terrible idea. And what happens is he hears that. He doesn't know he hears it. It's not loud, but he's like, you know, Something's just a little fishy about this. I just, you know, I don't know what it is, but, and that's important, you know, and that's what we need to get control of, is that core level, right? Because we're radiating stuff, and we're going to bring stuff in, and, and that, that part can't lie, right? So, there's a couple things that you need to do is from alignment for your beliefs, you know, what you're willing to do and what you aren't willing to do. Okay. So the other thing that creative visualization does is um, when you get quiet, right, and that's an important part of creative, creative visualization is getting quiet and relaxing, you have to look at yourself, your deepest self. And you're going to do that to manifest and change what we don't, what we don't want and what we do want. So, you, so one of the things about creative visualization, and it kind of fits into meditation just in general, is that you're, you're going to change. You know, you will change. It's like going to school, except for you're educating yourself. And you're educating yourself on what's the most important things. Okay? So like attracts like. You know, we've gone through and um, in some ways, you know, you can have opposites attract. Like a, when a man marries a woman, maybe he's introverted and she's extroverted. Or he's detailed and, you know, and she's not detailed kind of thing. So they kind of balance the partnership. But for the most part... You don't have your friends because, you know, you, you like what's opposite, you know, kind of thing. You like what's different about them. You know, you like friends because they're kind of like you. They have similar beliefs, you know, same kind of thing, like doing the same things. Um, but one of the things about that is that you create by default, you know. So what happens is, regardless of whether you're doing something intentionally, you're sending signals out, you're creating stuff the whole time, you're transmitting, and that stuff is eventually going to harden and you know and it'll form something solid okay so let me well, I wanted to show you something from the secret let me just go through and do this and it kind of gets into the idea of energy and thoughts and things. we all work with one infinite power we all guide ourselves by exactly the same laws The natural laws of the universe are so precise that we don't even have any difficulty building spaceships, we can send people to the moon, and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. I don't care if you're in India, if you're in Australia, New Zealand, Stockholm, or London, or Toronto, or Montreal, or New York. We're all working with one power, one law. It's attraction. The secret is the law of attraction. Everything that's coming into your life, you are attracting into your life. And it's attracted to you by virtue of the images you're holding in your mind. It's what you're thinking. You see, whatever is going on in your mind, you are attracting to you. Now, wise people have always known that. You can go right back to the ancient Babylonians. They've always known this. It's a small, select group of people. Why do you think that 1% of the population earns around 96% of all the money that's being earned? Do you think that's an accident? It's no accident. It's designed that way. They understand something. They understand the secret. And you are being introduced to the secret. The simplest way for me to look at the, the law of attraction is if I think of myself as a magnet, and I know that a magnet will attract to it, 
Very basically put, the law of attraction says that like attracts like. But we're really talking at a level of thought. Our job as humans is to hold on to the thoughts of what we want, make it absolute clear in our minds what we want, and from that we start to invoke one of the greatest laws in the universe, and that's the law of attraction. You, you, you become what you think about most, but you also attract what you think about most. If you see it in here, you're going to hold it here. And that principle can be summed up in three simple words. Thoughts become things. What most people don't understand is a thought has a frequency. Every thought has a frequency. We can measure a thought. And so if you're thinking that thought over and over and over again, or if you're imagining in your mind, okay, having that brand new car, having the money that you need, building that company, finding your soulmate, if you imagine what that looks like, you're emitting that frequency on a consistent basis. Thoughts are sending out that magnetic signal that is drawing the parallel back to you. See yourself living in abundance, and you will attract it. It always works. It works every time with every person. Here's the problem. Most people are thinking about what they don't want, and they're wondering why it shows up over and over and over again. The law of attraction doesn't care whether you perceive something to be good or bad or whether you don't want it or whether you do want it. It's responding to your thoughts. So if you're sitting there looking at a mountain of debt, feeling terrible about it, that's the signal you're putting out to the universe. Wow, I feel really bad because of all this debt I've got. You're just affirming it to yourself. You feel it on every level of your being. That's what you're gonna get more of. The law of attraction is really obedient. When you think of the things that you want, and you focus on them with all of your intention, the law of attraction will give you what you want every time. When you focus on the things that you don't want, I don't want to be late, I don't want to be late, you really are calling that into existence. The law of attraction doesn't hear that you don't want it, and so it's going to show up over and over and over again. The law of attraction is not biased to wants or don't wants. It manifests the things that you think you want. The law of attraction is always working. Whether you believe it or understand it or not, it's always working. It's working as much as you're thinking. Anytime your thoughts are flowing, the law of attraction is operational. When you're thinking about the past, present, or the future. The law of attraction is working. It's an ongoing process. You don't press pause, you don't press stop. It is forever in action, as your thoughts are. Creation is always happening. Every time an individual has a thought or a prolonged, uh, chronic way of thinking, they're in the creation process. Something is gonna manifest out of those thoughts. Law of Attraction says, we'll give you whatever it is you say and focus on. And so if you're complaining about how bad it is, what you're creating is more of how bad it is. Oh, look, I thought of that. I had a student named Robert. Robert was a gay man, and uh, he was taking an online course I have, part of which entails email access to me. And he outlined all of the grim realities of his life. In his job, all the people ganged up on him. And it was constantly stressful because of how nasty they were with him. When he walked down the street, he said every block he was accosted by homophobic people who wanted to abuse him in some way. He was wanting to become a stand-up comedian. And when he went out and did a stand-up comedy job, everybody heckled him about being gay. And his whole life was one of a lot of unhappiness and misery, and it all focused around this idea of being attacked because he was gay. I began to teach him that he was focusing on what he did not want. I had directed him back to his email that he sent me and said, read it again, look at all the things you do not want that you're telling me about. And I can tell you're very passionate about this. When you focus on something with a lot of passion, it makes it happen even faster. 
And then he really started taking this thing about focusing on what you want to heart, and he began really trying. What happened within the next six to eight weeks was absolutely a miracle. He said that all the people in his office that had been harassing him either transferred to another department, quit working at the company, or started totally leaving him alone, and he began to love his job. He noticed that when he was walking down the street that nobody came up to him and harassed him anymore. They just weren't there. I'm a very, very gay man. When he went and did his stand-up comedy routines, he started getting standing ovations, and nobody was heckling him. His whole life changed because he changed from focusing on what he did not want, what he was afraid of, what he wanted to avoid, to focusing what, on what he did want. So we may be very positive in our outlook and orientation, and we tend to attract positive people and positive events and circumstances. We may be very negative in our orientation, or very angry, in which case we tend to attract negative, angry people and negative, angry circumstances. And so you end up attracting to you the, the predominant thoughts that you're holding in your awareness, whether those thoughts are conscious or whether they're unconscious. That's the rub. If you look very carefully when it comes to the secret and the power of our mind and the power of our intention in our daily lives, it's all around us. All we got to do is open our eyes and look. You can see law of attraction everywhere. You draw everything to yourself. The people, the job, the circumstances, the health, the wealth, the debt, the joy, the car that you drive, the community that you're in and you've drawn them all to you, like a magnet. What you think about, you bring about. Your life is a physical manifestation of the thoughts that go on in your head. I mean, I'm not talking to you from the point of view of just wishful thinking or imaginary craziness. I'm talking to you from a deeper, basic understanding quantum physics really begins to point to this discovery. It says that you can't have a universe without mind entering into it, that the mind is actually shaping the very thing that is being perceived. Now, if you don't understand it, doesn't mean you should reject it. You don't understand electricity, probably. First of all, no one even knows what electricity is, and yet you enjoy the benefits of it. Do you know how it works? I don't know how it works, but I do know this, that you can cook a man's dinner with electricity, and you can also cook the man. People oftentimes, when they begin to understand the great secret, become frightened of, of all of these negative thoughts that they have. Two things they need to be aware of. One, it has been proven now scientifically that an affirmative thought is hundreds of times more powerful than a negative thought. So that eliminates a degree of worry right there. And the second thing is that, thank God, there's a time delay that all of your thoughts don't come true instantly. We'd be in trouble if they did. The time delay serves you. It allows you to reassess, think about what you want, and make a new choice. So you want to become aware of your thoughts, and you want to choose your thoughts carefully, and you want to have fun with this, because you are the masterpiece of your own life. You are the Michelangelo of your own life. The David that you are sculpting is you, and you do it with your thoughts. The leaders in the past who had the secret wanted to keep the power and not share the power. So they kept people ignorant of the secret. People went to work, they did their job, they came home. They were on a treadmill with no power because the secret was kept in the few. We live in a universe in which there are laws. Just as there's a law of gravity, if you fall off a building, it doesn't matter whether you're a good person or a bad person, you can hit the ground. Everything that's around you right now in your life, including the things you're complaining about, you've attracted. Now, I know at first blush, that's going to be something that 
you hate to hear. You know, you're going to immediately say, I didn't attract the car accident. I didn't attract this particular client. I didn't uh, particularly attract the debt. I didn't uh, attract whatever it happens to be that you're complaining about. And I'm here to be a little bit in your face and to say, yes, you did attract it. And this is one of the hardest concepts to get. But once you've accepted it, it's life transforming. This is part of the overall giant secret here. And most of us attract by default. We just think that we don't have any control over it. Our thoughts are on autopilot. Our feelings are on autopilot. And so everything is just brought to us by default. Now, if this is your first time to hear this, it may feel like, oh, I have to now monitor my thoughts. This is going to be a lot of work. It will seem like that at first. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of desire from, now don't get freaked out, a quantum physics point of view. Oh my God, this is going to talk about physics. I don't want to listen. Just relax. We're going to enjoy this. When we look around us, even at our own bodies, what we see is the tip of the iceberg. Think of this for a moment. Take your hand and look at it. Now, your hand looks solid, but it's really not. If you put it under a proper microscope, you'd see a mass of energy vibrating. Everything is made up of the exact same thing, whether it's your hand, whether it's the ocean, or whether it's a star. And that's not a new idea. A, a, a fuzzy-haired guy in 1925 wrote on his chalkboard, E equals mc squared. What that says is on one side of the equation is mass and light and everything that we perceive, but it all equals energy. And let me help you understand that just a little bit. There's the universe, of course, and our galaxy, and our planet, and then individuals, and then inside of this body are organ systems, and then there's cells, and then there's molecules, and then there's atoms, and then there is energy. So there are a lot of levels to talk about something on, but everything in the universe is energy. I don't care what city you're living in, you've got enough power in your body, potential power, to illuminate the whole city for nearly a week. So what do we know about the properties of energy? Number one, all energy has a vibration. All energy has a vibration. It emits a frequency. We are frequency generators. Uh, if you get close to someone's skin, you can feel infrared energy being good, given off. If you look at them, you're seeing light energy given off. We now have uh, scans where you can put a machine around somebody's head, instead of putting the electrodes on, the, on their head, and perceive and, and record the energy that their brain is giving off. What most people don't understand is a thought has a frequency. Every thought has a frequency. We can measure a thought. And so if you're thinking that thought over and over and over again, or if you're imagining in your mind, okay, having that brand new car, having the money that you need, building that company, finding your soulmate, if you imagine what that looks like, you're emitting that frequency on a consistent basis. Our job as humans is to hold on to the thoughts of what we want, make it absolute clear in our minds what we want, and from that we start to invoke one of the greatest laws in the universe, and that's the law of attraction. The law of attraction is whatever we concentrate on, concentrates on us. Whatever we move towards, moves towards us. Whatever we would love to manifest, love to be manifested. You become what you think about most, but you also attract what you think about most. The law of attraction is very clear. It clearly states energy is attracted to like energy. Everything's energy. Your body's energy. The room you're living in is energy. Energy operates by law. Very basically put, the law of attraction says that like attracts like. But we're really talking at a level of thought. And that principle can be summed up in three simple words. Thoughts become things. Anyone have any thoughts on that? On what they saw? <coughs> no comments? Okay, so one of the things that we're, you know, we're going to do, and this is actually in your, in your workbook, um, and we'll, we'll go through that over time, is that we're going to go over some of like the basic te techniques 
of creative visualization. And like I said, that you're going to find that it's kind of like magic. Even when you don't have the answer, you do. It's within you. And if you don't have it within you, that because we're connected, I can borrow it from him and get the answer, or from her and get the answer. Um, so we'll go over the basic techniques, setting goals, clearing, you know, getting rid of negativity, practice. But you know the most important thing is intuition and creativity. That's really what I'd like to accomplish. You know, to me that's one of my, my, um, my most important goals. And I'll give you a little bit of background on me, you know, like where I come from. And it's not an accident that we're here, and I'll, and I'll, I'll show you how that is. Um, in like the mid '80s, I was in defense, right? You know, I was working on—I worked on black projects and stuff like that. But at the time, I couldn't even tell my parents, you know, what I was doing, kind of thing. And then um, the late '80s, I started getting education of some of, of some stuff that's like this, you know, things that I think kids need to be taught, and it's something that I wanted to teach, right? Now, when I was in defense, I was actually making a lot of money, but. I somehow knew, you know, like further down the line that I was going to be really poor. You know, so I went into computer sales, right? And I was terrible at it. And what happened was I went from making, you know, at the time, and this is like in the 80s, right, that I was making like $70,000 a year and $25,000 was tax-free, right? So, so that's like making another 50000 So I was making like, um, I was doing making that and I went down to making like $12,000, right? But I knew that, you know what, I got to be even poorer than that. I have to be even poorer than that. And what happened was, is I started going to school a second time. And the only way I could afford to go to school was actually for real estate, was for real estate development. But the only way I could go to school at the time, because I was fighting with the IRS. And what happened was the IRS um, had said I had done, made some money, you know, in, in like the late 80s, which I didn't. But I didn't have the paperwork to show them at the time. And so what they did is they started garnishing my wages. They kind of like destroyed my life. They made me live on $269 every two weeks, which you can't do, right? I mean, they've changed the law since then, but at that time, that's what they, they could take everything, except for $269, or something like that, $200 something, $65, or whatever it was, every two weeks. And you couldn't, you know, you couldn't live on that, right? So what happened is, when I was going through that, I was, like, living on the street kind of thing. I was homeless. I mean, I didn't actually, like, sleep in someone's sleep in someone's doorway or anything like that, but I was technically homeless. Unfortunately, I had people that I could like, you know, sleep in the back of trucks, like moving trucks and stuff like that. And it'd be kind of funny because one morning, you know, they get up to go fuel the truck and I'm still sleeping, right? And all of a sudden you, you feel the thing vibrate and you're driving up. It's like, man, where am I going? <laughs> I hope we're going to stop. And it, just, and it would just get gas, right? And I'm like, oh, God. you know, I'm not going up to like Nevada or something like that. Um, but what happened was, is during that time I ran into someone, his name was Warren Prince, and, uh, and he told me, this is after church, and he said, you know, Alan, there's a power that can help you. And I'm like, okay, you know. He says, and here's how you can access it. Is that what happens is, what you can do is ask it a question. You know, the universal mind maybe is what he said, but he said power, you know, but, but he also would call it the universal mind. He said, ask it a question, and what happens is, You'll be prompted later. You'll walk around, do whatever, go out throughout your day, and you're going to have a prompting, an intuition, to open up a book. You know, and you, and you can specifically ask, ask in that form, to open up a book. And when you open up the book, you know, I flip the page open, and he says, just open it up, and point, point on a page, it's going to be your answer. And I'm like, oh, you know what, I'm gullible. I'll try, kind of thing. And most of the other stuff that Warren said was, was right, so I did it. It worked. And so I did it again, and it worked again. And, I, and I've since found that it works about 95, 98% of the time. I mean, if I do it, and you open it up and the answer's not there, it's not going to help to like, oh, let's close it and open it back up again, right? It's just not there. It's like trying to start your car when the battery's dead. Turning the key a second time and a third time is not going to work, right? So that was my access to the power, right? My access to this internal thing. That was my entry to it. And it gets, it gets a lot more interesting. So when I was going through the stuff with going to school, I, I was sitting at a bus stop down in Laguna Hills Mall. And I, was, I don't think I was waiting for the bus. It was a Saturday morning, but I was sitting there at a bus stop. It's actually an outside circular bench. So it wasn't necessarily just for the bus. It's there. And I was sitting down there, 
Um, and this old guy comes up, and he says, um, you know, he starts talking to me. And I, I really didn't want to have a conversation. I'm reading my book, and I, when I really didn't want to talk with him. And so he asked me a question, and I answered it, and I went back to my newspaper, you know, like a little no local newspaper. He asked me another question. And I go back to my local newspaper. Um, and then he asked me another one, right? And I give him a one, one sentence answer, and I go back again. And he did this about seven times. And finally, I was like, this guy is not going to go away, right? This light bulb goes on. It's like there's a reason he's here. So I fold my newspaper up, I set it down, and I listen to him 100%, right? And so he, um, he, he told me about his, his daughter, you know, how she was taking so much beta carotene. She was on this health kick, and she was take, taking so much beta carotene and eating carrots that the corner of her eyes were turning orange. You know, he said, she's going crazy, but I love her, you know, as long as she's not hurting herself. And he was talking about, he worked for LBJ, you know, so we talked about that, you know, with government. And I guess he was in charge of $2 billion budget, so he must have been, you know, somewhat up there kind of thing. And... Um, you know, he said about looking for a job. He told me about his, his um, you know, like a surgery that he had. And then he goes, in the middle of, oh, and there's one other thing, too. When I was doing this, I was working part-time for Tony Robbins, right? You know, you know who he is. He got walk on fire and stuff like that. So it's like, sort of like, well, you create your world, right? You create your happiness, you set your goals and all that stuff, and you'll, you'll be happy. And so he says, you know, Alan, there's no such thing as happiness. And I'm like, I, I, no, I'm working for Tony Robbins part-time, you know, I, there's, of course there's happiness. And he goes, no, there's no such thing as happiness. He goes, but you know when you're unhappy, don't you? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, everybody knows when you're unhappy. He goes, all happiness is, is a contrast with unhappiness. And I'm like, well, you know, I see what you're saying, I'm open-minded, I don't agree with you, but I'll think about it, right? And so what happened was, is it was later that day, or maybe the, maybe, maybe the next time, but I'm pretty sure it was later that afternoon, I decided, or after he said it, I walked away and I said, well, you know what, I'm going to ask the power. I'm throw it to the power where I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get my answer in the book, right? And so what happened was I was in the Laguna Hill, or the El Toro Library, which is on El Toro Road down there, and um, walk around, and in the middle of the library were some, um, was a, like a bookshelf, and then around it was couches and stuff like that where they encourage you to read. Right? You know, so you stay there and you browse and stuff like that. Well, right in the middle of that, that library was this bookshelf, and there was a whole assortment of books that were there. I walked all around the library looking at stuff, and nothing really prompted me. And so something prompted me about going to this bookshelf, right? And, and this bookshelf was just a mess of books. I think what it was is when they had books that were dropped off, and then they were, they were brought in, they would just stack them up there you know, on this shelf, so you have a physics book next to a you know, history book, next to an art book or whatever. There was no organization. And so what happened was, I was prompted to pull something out of this bookshelf, right? I had no idea what it was, because it was so thin that you didn't even have anything, you know, there was no writing on the edge. It was just front and back, because it was just, you know, a thin edge. So it wasn't until I actually pulled it out that I knew what it was, and it was, it was the cliff notes for the Count of Monte Cristo, right? So I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. You know, I think I heard the story, and I never read it or anything, but I probably saw the movie or something like that, so I opened it up, right? And I went, I point to a page, it said, there's no such thing as happiness. It's only when you've known the depths of despair that you can know ultimate bliss. And then there was other stuff that was part of it too, so I'm like, maybe the old guy was right. right? <laughs> but my point is, you know, and to me, when that happened, it was like an unusual thing. It was sort of like, oh, this is really kind of weird. But to me now, that's, that's normal. That happens like all the time. And when you start getting access to the intuition part, the creativity, that power helps you. You know, it helps you like in amazing ways, and it's through transmission, you know. So the fact that we're here is not an accident. I can tell you, it's absolutely positively not an accident. 
So what are the five steps to try to manifest something, right? Pick a goal. You clearly have to have something to shoot for. You've got a definite target. And then, and then you have to know, when do I hit that target, right? So you can say, well, I want to make more money. Oh, yeah, I made $10 more this week. Someone, you know, I've got this extra check that I, that I want. So you have to have a, a very specific goal, right? And then the other thing is that you have to have a goal that when you get distracted, right, when people are going to be in your way, you're still going to be shooting for that goal. You're going to keep the effort. You have the determination to get it. And the sad thing is, is that this goal, you know, you can do it purposefully, but you can also do it from a negative standpoint, right? Like what they're saying is that if I keep visualizing something that's bad, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get a ticket. I don't want to get a ticket. I don't want to get a ticket. And you get a ticket. Because you're creating something with your thoughts anyway. You're transmitting it out there. So when you pick a goal, you know, what are the advantages of that? And I'm not going to go into this too much, right? But this is actually like a little map that you have of all the benefits of goals, right? So where you can look at it and what are some of the things that it does? It enhances your self-image, enhances your energy, your, your, um, your energy levels, your awareness. It gives, you can examine your weaknesses and your strengths. Right? So when you achieve something, that's about the meditation part. You, you really get to know your internal side. What are my weaknesses or my strengths? What am I willing to do? What am I not willing to do? What's important to me? Um, it, it, it gives you a sense of purpose, direction, control, development. I'm not going to get too much prioritization. So there's a lot of things that happens when you have goals and there's a map that kind of goes with that for, to try and achieve that. Now, you don't have to do any of this. If you do, you'll probably speed it up and you can be more tangible. And maybe, if, as, as Fred was saying, you know, you have to see people which have to have a plan and tangible stuff like that. They're more likely to, you know, to go through that route, right? Because that's their evidence. But then the other thing is you make an affirmation, right? So I pick a goal and I put it out to the universe. And that's as this person is doing. I just go through and go out and, hey, this is, this is what I want. This is it. There's a cute little video. here. Be a shark. Now my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my Because they have so much more time to use this stuff. Okay. So you have to picture your goal as being true. Imagine what it'd be like to see and have it. To go through, and when you're when you're seeing and having it, um, there's a couple evidence patterns that you have. The the clearest thing is to try to do and incorporate all your senses. You know, like say for example, um, if I had bought a house that you're visualizing buying a house. And what I would do is if I walk in the house, maybe what I might do is touch the door. You know, feel, feel the door, feel the coldness of the door. Tap my fingernails on the glass. You know, if there's glass in the door. So you can, so you can hear that. And you can hear when you're tapping fingers on the glass, right? So when I visualize it, you know, you can hear what that sounds like. And that's something you can put on in your head. And then um, what I might do is walk in and you can sort of rub your feet on the floor. Maybe there's a marble floor there or something like that. Then you go into the kitchen and you Turn the water on. Put your hand underneath the underneath the spout. You can feel the cold water going on, you know, running over your fingers, and, and you can visualize that. And you can feel that. And it's very tangible, and you can feel it going from cold water to warm water. And you feel the air bubbles, and you can shut it off, and you can kind of just go go throughout the room. But that's an example of imagining what it's like to see it and have it. And the amazing thing is that your body will produce that over time if you keep doing it. It'll it'll just create it. So you really have to see it. You know, you really have to visualize it. And then you have to imagine it. You have to feel it. Okay. The other thing is that you can do is you can, um, 
turn it over to the higher self, you know, your higher power to manifest it for you. And that's like I was saying is that that's probably the most, I don't know if I say the, the most important, I think, it, I think I would, is that the most important part is to recognize that that power exists. And whether you think that's God or, I don't know, Jehovah or Allah or whatever, doesn't, doesn't really matter. All I can tell you is absolutely, it, it positively exists. You know, I don't know if that's something that's within me, but I gave you an example of that existing. There's no way that I knew that that paragraph was in that book. There's absolutely no way. I didn't even know that that book was there. And yet here I was, you know, attracted to a library that's in, you know, middle of, I can't say middle of nowhere because I knew where the library was, but there's no way that I could find that with what that guy was telling me. And there's a power that helps you, right? So you turn it over to that higher, that higher part of you, whatever that may be. And then, but here's the here's the important part: is to follow your intuitions, right? When you're prompted, that's that's kind of like my entry point to getting to the power. You know, when that guy told me, said, "Hey, you know what? Here's how you can access the power. Throw the question out, and your intuition is going to help you find a book." And what happens is, that's just a start. That's just exercising a muscle that you start using your intuition. And then what happens is, as that muscle gets stronger. It expands, and you can use your intuition in other ways too. So you, even though it may seem kind of crazy, you really have to follow that because there's going to be a, another side of you that's going to say, "Oh, that's a stupid idea," you know, "Oh, that's dumb," right? Because you always have those two voices that one of you says, "This is what I want to do," and another voice says, "No, you're an idiot. You can't. You can't do that." So you really have to follow your your intuition to get access to that stuff. Okay. And then you have to be open to growing and changing. Because as you, as you do this, as you examine yourself, your goals are going to change. You know, you may try to do things. You have kids, and all of a sudden the things that were important previously, you have kids, and it's like, goes all out the window. You know, and say like for a woman, it's, there's a hormonal change, right? So it's not, um, it, it's not just that their attitude changes, but their body is physically changing. The interesting part is, when a woman has a kid, that the, the, her husband, you know, the man that's around her, there's, there's um, hormones that she's emitting and it actually affects him. So it kind of flicks a switch in the That he becomes, you know, more uh, maternal. Grumpy. Well, that's because that's lack of sleep, right, when you first have kids. So one of the things that's kind of interesting, and they talk about with the sports stuff, and that's where really a lot of this stuff started <coughs> from a standpoint of visualization, where you have a clearly tangible, um, a tangible result. So what happened is, you know, the Russians were starting to use visualization. I think they did it like in the 50s, the late 50s, I think is when it started, right? And they were just kicking our butt, you know? That they were, they were kicking everybody's butt. It's like, why? What is it that they're doing that's different? So what happened was, is that they did a study, right? Um, of people that would do visualization, and they would have, you know, like different groups. So they had 100% training. That's all they would do is just do the training, like the girl. That she was just doing her training, just doing her practicing, physical practicing, right? 100%. So then there was another group that they had, and what happened is they said, okay, let's do 75% physical, 25% mental training. That seems like a pretty good mix, doesn't it? You know, because you actually have to do it. I have to actually play golf, because I, you know, how you can play golf unless you're playing golf? And maybe you just, you kind of tone it up a little bit and do the positive affirmations like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. So you do the 25%. To me, instinctively, that seems like the optimal thing. Right? So, and then the next step would be, okay, well, let's do 50-50 and see what happens. Right? And this may be, hey, you know what, if 25% is good, 50% may be better. You know, who knows sort of thing. But to me, it seems like this should have been, you know, what the best thing was. So then what they did is they had another one where they did 25% physical training. Right? Just a little quarter and 75% mental. And to me, that seems like it's just not enough. It's not enough actually doing it. But what's interesting is that the group, the group four, that only did 25% physical and 75% mental, they performed the best out of everyone. To me, that's shocking, right? You're just spending 25% of your time actually doing it, and the other 75% preparing for doing it. You know, it's kind of like, um, it sort of reminds, and I'm sure you guys have heard the story before, right? About two guys are chopping down trees, and um, you know, they're having a competition, and one of the guys, about every hour, he stops for a little bit, you know, and then the other guy, who, who didn't stop, he said, I'm not going to stop at all. And so he's chopping the whole time, and every time he heard the other guy stop, he's like, he's chopping even harder. It's like, I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to stop, right? So they get to the end of the day, and the one guy that stopped every once in a while, 
was, um, you know, he, had, he chopped like three times as many logs. And the other guy's like, how did how, you do that? You know, you stopped all day. You kept stopping all, all throughout the day. I never stopped. I never stopped. Not one time. And yet he chopped three times as many. It was like, well, the only time I stopped was to sharpen my saw. Right? So that's kind of like the preparation, the sharpening your saw. And as we can see, that's, that's like the biggest part. The doing is not so hard. It's the preparation. Okay? So they discover that mental images can also act as muscular impulses. That what happens is, is as they said in, in that other video, and that was perfect, I didn't realize that you were gonna you were gonna play that. But when you visualize something, your brain, there's actually like little little synapses that kick off and connect up like you're actually physically doing it, even though you're not. You know, it's kind of like if you've ever seen someone, right, where they're they're um, laying down, they're sleeping. And they're dreaming, and you're like, you know, I'm going like this, right? Because things are kicking off. And they're not actually physically doing it, but their body's responding because they're kicking off those nerves. And clearly when you're having a dream, that's probably like when it's the most, you know, the most real to you. Our brain has an astonishing hundred billion neurons brain cells all connected together. Learning is about creating and strengthening pathways through these neurons for impulses of electricity. But between each and every connection in our brains there's a tiny gap called a synapse. For any of us to learn something new the electrical signal has to jump across this gap to continue its journey. The gap between the two brain cells is tiny, but that doesn't mean it's straightforward for a signal to get from one side to the other. For us, it's like crossing a deep ravine. And getting from one side to the other should tell us something about the way we learn. The first time a signal crosses from one brain cell to the other demands the most effort. And it's the same when we cross our ravine. The first trip across is the hardest. Having crossed the ravine once, the journeys across get easier and easier. And a similar thing happens when we learn something. To start with, learning is difficult. the signal crosses the gap between the brain cells again and again, we establish a more solid pathway. Sorry about that. By the time we've made the crossing over and over again, it becomes effortless. We can do it whenever we like. Finally learn something. I took the visualization process from the Apollo program and instituted it during the 1980s and 90s into the Olympic program. And it was called visual motor rehearsal. When you visualize, then you materialize. And the interesting thing about the mind is we took Olympic athletes and then hooked them up to sophisticated biofeedback equipment and had them run their event only in their mind. Incredibly, the same muscles fired 
in the same sequence when they were running the race in their mind as when they were running it on the track. How could this be? Because the mind can't distinguish whether you're really doing it or whether it's just a practice. I think if you've been there in the mind, you'll go there in the body. When you're visualizing, when you've got that picture playing out in, in, in your mind, always and only dwell upon the end result. Okay, so one of the things that you have is that there's kind of like three steps to creation, right? And one is that you have all the different contrasts, I guess you can say, is that what are the, all the different outcomes that you have to formulate a desire, right? And then what happens is the universe, the universe answers that, and then depending on what your vibrational setup, and that's, that's probably one of the things that I'd really like to accomplish here, you know, here is to change your vibration, to raise your vibration, to raise your energy level. Because when you're working at a higher energy level, you can manifest things faster. And, and the other thing that it does too is that what happens is when you're working from that higher energy level, that kind of multiplies your thoughts times 10. So if you have the negative thought, that's times one, and you'll still probably have some of that stuff. I mean, you have to kind of control, but that's times one. But when you raise your energy level, that's times 10. So what are you going to have? You're going to have 10 to one to get the results that you want, right? So when you create by default, you observe conditions and formula desire, right? And, and it may be, I do not want this. And so what happens is the universe answers that and gives you more of it, right? But the good thing is if you, if you keep your vibration low when you're doing that, the creation by default, um, for negative things, you'll, you'll create less of it. You know, same thing for deliberate creation, where you try to raise your vibration. Okay? So what are the four, you know, um, <coughs> visualization techniques that you have, right? So we have the, the pink bubble technique, right? So what you want to do, and we'll probably, we'll probably do some of that today. You know, we'll do like a relaxa relaxation. Um, so you want to relax in a comfortable place. Now you could be, I, I kind of like to lay down. It's easier for me, you know, sort of thing. But if you lay down, sometimes you can fall asleep. So at least sit down in a comfortable chair. Maybe you can be a lazy boy or something like that. Um, but get in a comfortable place and relax. You know, here I show the dog. He's in a really comfortable place, right? So then the next thing you want to do is clearly visualize what you want, right? So what does he want? He wants bones, okay? So that you can see it. And in and, and visualization, it doesn't necessarily... I mean, it's nice if it's visual, right? But there's, there's different ways that you communicate. Some of us are auditory. I'm, I'm actually more auditory. I like, when I um, learn something, I actually like listening to it on a tape or something like that, and I can concentrate and kind of get in my head and just, and just hear it. But other people really are visual. I mean, clearly from a visual map, you kind of tend to remember it more, right? Because there's a lot more signals that are kind of coming in. But you can also feel it, too. So I think Fred, he says he can't visualize. But, for, but one of the things that you can do is, for him, visualization could be feeling something. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with seeing with eyes, but it's just something that you, you feel internally. Go ahead, Fred. I'd be curious out of the room to find out how many people really visualize and how many people verbalize or people just sense it. I'm just, I'm just curious because it's uh, an interest of mine. Yeah. Does any, has anyone looked at what the primary um, learning mode is if it's visual in nature? Okay, so CC, so something pretty high. How about who's auditory? That's interesting. Okay, and then how about kinesthetic, where they kind of through touch? Sense. So it's with that, which kind of makes sense. You know, it's with that. Um, I would think that more people are auditory though, but um, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's the way that you're built. It's like when Sal was saying that here's what we do. You know, and that's the way you are. So you visualize it, um, and then what you want to do is you can go ahead and, and put it in a little pink bubble, right? I, I actually use clouds. You know, if you do something like this, you can use a clear bubble. It's just that pink is, is a healing. You know, it's like love. Pink is, a, is, a, is kind of like a symbol for love, right? <coughs> so what you'll do is you think about it, you put it in a bubble, and then you just let it go out. So you let it go out from you, and then you, what you can do is you let it go to the higher power, right? To let him figure it out. Just like I was doing the, the, the thing with answering, getting a, get an answer, right? And I, and I encourage you to actually try that. You know, Fred actually tried it, and he got a result from that. I don't know if you've tried it, you know, you've tried it since then, but it works for me, and again, um, you know, we're all a little bit different, so our entry to that uh, intuition can be different, but it's the, it's the access to our intuition that's most important. So you put it to the higher power to figure out, and then eventually you get your result. 
right? <clears throat> then you manifest your result. Okay. So the other thing you can do is you can um, you can picture your ideal scene, right? So um, you can and picturing your ideal scene is like an imagination. So it's kind of like if you wanted to have a result, right? Like you were making a presentation. You're making a sales presentation, for example. That what you would go ahead and do is um, see every component of that. You know, you, you'd have like a snapshot of that. There's one of the guys that I know that what he did, and it's actually a great idea, is that he took a picture of his house, right? And, and then what he did is he had a car that he wanted, and he photoshopped it right in front of the, you know, the front driveway kind of thing. And then he photoshopped his wife's car in there. And like a, a dog in the yard and stuff like that. So it's something that he could physically look at it. His actual house, right? And he had all the stuff that was put in there. And that was a great idea, you know, to do something like that, to do it, to do it visual, right? Um, the other thing you can do is, um, I actually jumped ahead a little bit, is writing affirmations. I kind of skipped past that. So, in creative visualization, right, it doesn't need to be visual. It just, you need to just contact that idea, and affirmations are a way to do that. So what you want to do is you want to think about what your affirmations are, right, to try to word it so it's nice for you. I mean, I can say something <clears throat> that works for me, and the, and the wording's totally wrong for you. So to recommend it to you and say, oh yeah, that's a good affirmation, and put it down, you really have to think about what your affirmations are. And then write them down 10 or 20 times on paper every day. That doesn't mean review them, it means write them down again in the morning. Write down what your affirmations are. And then write them down in the first, second, and third person. Right? I think the number one thing is, you know, if there was an order and say you can be lazy and you will be lazy about it, you know, it's one thing is to just review your affirmations, just to try to look at them and go through them, right? To physically see them. Because like, oh, you know, I wrote them yesterday, so at least I go, I go through it. Then you go through it as much as you can. You know, clearly with all this stuff, the more you do it, um, the more you'll create, you'll create something, right? Um, and then you're writing down first, second, third person. So an example of this thing, right, is that <clears throat> for what we're doing, and it's very, it's very reasonable to say you can double your income with doing this. Right? This is very reasonable. So I would say I Allen taught visualization techniques that have doubled the income of those that have learned to create creativity visualize. Right? So I said I Allen taught, then you say Alan, you taught, second person, and then Alan taught. So if you do that, you're all accessing different parts of your mind. Right? To try to do something like that. And it's and it's a small thing, but for example, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's an interesting thing about what he did he used to work out. That he figured out, and you know how you know what he was like and stuff like that at, at his peak. But one of the things that he figured out is that when he would work out, a lot of times, you know, people, you probably all exercise at one time. You do like three sets of ten or three sets of five or something like that or do whatever. Well, what he would do is he would do like a little pyramid. So what happens is he would do twelve, and then he would do eight, and then he would do six, and then he would do four, and then he would do two, right? So that was something that when you're trying to do two and you're, and you're getting exhausted, you're using your muscles in a different way than if you're using... 10 of them. You know, like say if I'm exercising something 10 times and I get exhausted, I'm going to be using my muscles in a completely different way if all I can do is two, and I'm like, oh man, I can't do any more. And it's the same thing with this, that when you're using it in different persons, or the more ways that you can do this, if you use affirmations, visualization, the more that you're going to balance out how your brain acts. Okay? And then the other thing you can do is a treasure map, right? So we'll create a treasure map for a single goal so it's not too complex. And that's where you're just, you're just actually just laying out on a, on, a, on a sheet of paper. It's kind of like what I had with the goals before, right? And then you want to make it so it's conveniently sized that you can look at this map, right? So it could be, hey, you know what, I got room that I can put up on a wall, so you put it up on a wall. It could be that it's in a notebook. It could be I have like a little, you know, a little book like this that would be, uh, a, you know, a loose leaf notebook and then put it in there. And I'll make this stuff available to you, too. You know, I'm actually going to put this online. I think um, I have a website, Richer Than, Richer Than King Solomon, I think, and I'll put it on there for you guys. So um, show the ideal scene you want, show it as a real setting, and then include something that has to do with what you're infinite. You know, if that's God, 
then that's fine. You know, for me, I, I actually, what I consider the infinite, I grew up during Star Wars, so I call it the Force, right? Mm -hmm. But that's for me, that's, that's, that's my reality kind of thing. But you can call it whatever you want, I call it the Force or I call it the Power. But all I can tell you is it absolutely positively exists in Pelsey. And <clears throat> you can say, well, I don't believe in that, I don't think it exists. <clears throat> but I've given the example of, it's kind of like not believing in water, right? You can say, well, you know what, I don't believe in water, and that's fine, you can believe in it or not. But if you don't believe in water, then, what you, then you'll never be able to take that water and put it with corn and dirt and grow corn, right? That, that feeds people, makes you money, right? And benefits the world. If you, put, if you never believed in water, you can never do that. Is that a punishment because of the fact that you don't believe in water? Not really. I mean, you're penalized a little bit, kind of thing. But if you believe in water, you, you get more. So what I want to do is I actually want to go through a visualization with you guys. <clears throat> I think we'll have, no, we'll have enough time to finish it. Um, Alan, can I ask you a question? Sure. How long will that be? Because I have to be somewhere at 9. It'll be at 9. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be at 9 o'clock. I'll be done. No, it'll no, be, no. Is it... Oh, you have to be have there to be at nine. nine. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> you could you could leave early. It'll be about twenty minutes, something like that. No. So. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what I want you guys to do, and then how do I shut this off? <clears throat> so I want you guys to relax. And of all this, and of all this stuff, I, I think, you know, for, for me, right, when I started this 20 years ago, <clears throat> you will find, and maybe Danny, you know, because Danny's done some of this stuff too, and probably some of the other guys have started it too, you're going to find that when you relax, as you raise your vibration, it's going to hurt. I mean, you think like, oh, this should be all nice and stuff like that, it's going to hurt. But if you're doing it right, what's going to happen is it's going to be just like you took a, you grabbed a wire that was in the outlet, and you, and it feels like it. And I'll tell you why did that happen. I didn't understand. I just, I just know that this is what happens. It hurts. You won't feel that now, but if you're doing it right, eventually you're gonna, you're gonna feel pain. But here's what happens. Um, it wasn't until I read something that was like on a Book of Miracles or something like that. It was about the Kabbalah, Kabbalah, right? Kabbalah. 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 Kabbalah, no, Kabbalah, I think is what, I think it was, but either way, however you pronounce it. And so one of the things he said is that what happens is, is that um, the way we are natively, um, so the way we are natively, if we're a person, right, and we're, say, we're, say we're laying down, right, like that, you know, laying on a, on a bed, and then here's a, here's a window, right? So what happens is you have this energy from the universe that comes in through that window. You know, comes in and we're exposed to it. The problem is, when you have this energy, when it's full sun, right, and usually we're, in reality, right, we're, we're surrounded by atmosphere and stuff like that that protects us. Because if we, that atmosphere wasn't protecting us and those sun's rays came in, we'd just be blasted, we'd be nuked, right? So what happens is the way we are native, we have this energy, but none of us can really accept that. We're not at the vibration of this higher energy. So it's like having a blanket covered over on top of you, right? And not, not only is it one blanket, but it's like ten blankets. Right? And so what happens is you don't see any of the light as a result of that. But if you go through and you strip off one of the blankets, maybe just a little bit of light comes through. Right? And when you do that, that's energy. And if that energy is above your energy, it's going to hurt, right? And it's not bad. I'm just saying, you just have to get used to it. And you, and you, then you remove another blanket, right? More light comes through. More energy comes through. And as you absorb that energy, right, you have the ability to put it out yourself. You know, you, you radiate stuff out yourself. So then what happens is you take another one out. And you take another one, right? And this is as you get closer and closer to the power. And as you do that, you're getting more and more to really, 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 really high energies, like nuclear power, right? And you just can't do that out of the box. So as you, as you do this, I'm just going to warn you that you're, you'll feel 
weird stuff that's going to happen. But the more that you do that, the better it is. You know, over time, I, and it's just something you'll experience if you if you go ahead and you do this stuff. So let's go ahead and start this. And what this is, is actually kind of a, um, it's almost like a shaman way, retrieving your destiny. That's what we're going to go through right now. And the big thing is to do the relaxation. That's going to be probably one of the things to really focus on, is working on relaxing. It's something probably between now and next week to really try to work on relaxing at least once or twice a day. Every day, we determine our destiny by what we think and do. With a shift in perception, we can dramatically improve the quality of our lives, the goals we accomplish, and the degree of happiness we attain. In this guided meditation, you will open channels to guidance that will lead you to fulfill your highest destiny. The sound frequencies provided will guide you into the dreamlike meditative state known as Theta. Theta is the brain state where magic literally happens in the crucible of neurological activity. Illumination, inspiration, and deep insight accompany the Theta state. In Theta, you can receive information and ideas that clearly define and shape the direction of your life. On side two of this program are music and Theta frequencies only, providing an opportunity for you to perfect and evolve your meditation at your own pace. Practice this meditation every day for the next four to six weeks. It works on deep levels of the psyche to open new pathways and build structures for fulfillment that will unfold in your life. The mind creates in extraordinary ways. It attracts the very things that we focus on. Through asking and focusing on your deeper purposes, you will attract people and circumstances that are in alignment with your destiny path. So now, find a comfortable place to sit and lie down. Take care that your spine is straight and your arms and legs are unlocked. This allows your natural channels of energy to open and flow freely. Close your eyes begin to breathe slowly and deeply. When you breathe in, send the breath deep into your solar plexus. Expand your stomach. Feel the breath rise upward, flooding your chest, spreading out through your shoulders and neck. Then gently push the breath out. A 
soft current of relaxing energy flows down into your thighs and legs. Feel the flow of energy as it washes through your ankles and feet. Mm-hmm. But there 
continuing to gaze into each other's eyes, you melt into the feeling of the deep bond that you share. As you merge into each other's depths, a bridge begins to form. A bridge that leads to the other side. Standing with your feet firmly on the ground beneath you, take a moment to weigh the consequences of walking across this bridge. Standing on the precipice of making a decision, you wonder whether you can trust this situation. See the jagged rocks at the bottom of the gorge, hundreds of feet below you. Looking back at where you've been, see the vast and empty desert behind you. Looking straight ahead, you see an enchanted world that holds the mysteries of your future. Stepping off the bridge, you reconnect with the mystic, the wise sage that has been waiting for you. You are led down a narrow path cut between rocks. Tall trees and lush palms border the path. The air is faintly moist against your skin. You are refreshed by the 
scent of flowers and the sound of flowing water. A feeling of positive anticipation wells up within you. Turning a corner, you enter an extraordinary sanctuary in nature. And you wonder if this is a mirage or if it is real. There are hot springs and waterfalls and soft shaded places to rest. Out of the corner of your eye, you glimpse a rainbow with colors so dazzling it seems that you can touch them. As you gaze in awe upon this fantastic world, you wonder what secrets it holds. A sense of homecoming flows through you as if you finally arrived at the place you longed for. A place where you can spend time of yourself and the mysteries of your destiny. Stepping into the silky pool, you feel that you are sinking deeper into yourself, floating in buoyant suspension. You are safe and supported. The water is cleansing your mind and revitalizing your sense of water is healing you and purifying your spirit. Feel the nourishment in this place.
enter the depths of your heart and yearn for the personal qualities and virtues you need to grow beyond where you are now. Focus, balance, integrity, strength, courage, innocence, momentum, enthusiasm.
to return to your daily life. Your mentor appears with blessings and gifts. You are reminded to return to the sacred place. It is where you will gain all the wisdom and guidance you need to manifest your destiny. Then he smiles, and with a twinkle in his eye, up the sack you left behind. No longer worn with age, the richly woven silk shimmers with magic. You can feel the power radiating from the gifts that reside inside. Gifts that in the days and weeks to come will appear in your life in perfect order and in perfect time. You're already well on your way.